Okay, so um, council has seen this before, before uh, NHGRI or any institute in NIH can publish a funding opportunity announcement, we need concept clearance or approval from the council. So you're gonna hear five presentations today, one at a time, there'll be a discussion, question and answer session with council, and then I will ask for a vote to approve the concept. And so Tina Gatlin, program director in uh, genome sciences is gonna lead off with the GREAT program concept. Tina, go ahead. Okay, thanks Rudy. So I'm pleased to have this opportunity to address council today to present this concept, the genome research experiences to attract talented undergraduates into the genomics field to promote diversity. And so this GREAT program concept is for consideration as another path forward in our efforts to enhance the diversity of the genomics workforce. And as a follow on to Vince's presentation, I would like to say that it was a privilege to contribute to the important work of the Diversity Working Group. And I'd like to thank Vince for his fine leadership, which led to the release of our action agenda. So this concept was originally formulated last summer and was further refined by a group of my colleagues. And so I would like to start by acknowledging Lisa, Brianna, Lorgetta, and Jen for their help in shaping this concept. So regarding concepts to champion a diverse genomics workforce, so as Eric mentioned in his director's report, we have already moved forward with two initiatives that were approved at last council. So an F99K00 pre-doc to post-doc transition award, as well as a K18, which is a short-term career enhancement award for faculty members. And so we follow on by bringing to this council two more concepts, this great program, and then also the grants for new investigators to promote diversity. And then for next May Council and beyond, we do anticipate bringing forward future concepts stemming from the action agenda. For the outline of my presentation, so I'll first state the goal of the concept, provide some background and our rationale for moving this idea forward, present the general scope and objectives, and then go over how this concept relates to ongoing activities, and then open the floor to council discussion. And as Rudy mentioned, then he would then ask council for a vote on the concept. So for this proposed GREAT program, the overarching goal is to encourage undergraduates from underrepresented backgrounds who are enrolled at diversity serving institutions to pursue further training and careers in genomics research that are within NHGRI mission areas. This will be achieved by providing students research educational activities and within the structure of institutional partnerships. And as background, as, as Vince described already, so NHGRI recently published an action agenda detailing the Institute's vision for building and championing a diverse workforce. This proposed program addresses elements of all four goal areas of the action agenda in terms of developing programs, facilitating inclusion and retention, developing evaluation metrics, but especially addresses, as Vince mentioned, the, the second goal, which is to develop and support training programs and networks that connect undergraduate and graduate education to careers in genomics. And then in particular, via sub goal 2.2 in the document, to ensure that undergraduate diversity serving institutions are aware of and tightly connected to that network. So diversity serving institutions are defined here as institutions of higher education, that have a historical mission or dedicated commitment to educating individuals from diverse backgrounds. So institutes such as HBCUs and Hispanic serving schools. And so I'll, I'll say a little more about our focus on diversity serving institutes on a later slide. So the data shows that underrepresentation under, under in, in the health related sciences includes individuals from certain racial and ethnic groups, as well as individuals with disabilities or from disadvantaged backgrounds, and then women at the faculty level. And as such, NIH leadership encourages institutes within NIH to continue efforts to diversify their respective research workforces. And the largest category of underrepresentation are certain racial and ethnic groups. And so uh, this is a category that's, uh, that can be used as a good proxy for underrepresentation. And so the data shows that racial and ethnic minorities constitute about 34% of the US population, yet they comprise only 10% of students who are enrolled in genetics or genomics graduate programs in the US, according to NSF data. 
And then in our, and then in our own internal analysis, a large fraction of the grad students that NHGRI supports is via the T32 Institutional Training Grant. And in the past decade, only 14% of T32 supported graduate students were from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. So this is slightly better than the 10% from NSF data, but it's still drastically lower than the, than the national population. So these statistics highlight the need to strengthen the pathway from undergraduate to graduate school for underrepresented groups. So for scope and objectives, again, the overall focus is to help diversify the genomic workforce and research educational support will be provided to undergraduates who are enrolled at institutions that have a historical mission to educate underrepresented students. The program will provide resources for institutes institutions to establish partnerships in order to implement collaborative approaches to genome research education. The partnership must include a lead or applicant institution that is a diversity serving institution, and then one or more partnership institutions, which must be a research intensive institution with a, with a suitable research base in genomics for graduate level training, as evidenced by a significant number of potential mentors with R01 or equivalent extramural research support. So I would like to say more about why NHGRI is interested in this kind of partnership model. So first of all, this is a space that NHGRI and most high Cs have not ventured into before. And one of the recommendations stemming from an ACD, an ACD report on diversity in the biomedical research workforce was to support creative partnerships between research intensive institutions and diversity serving institutions, which are also often under-resourced. So partnerships are an effort to help level the playing field between low and high resource institutions. Leveling the playing field uh, being language we often hear from diversity focused offices at NIH, particularly the NIH Office of Scientific Workforce Diversity. And there is evidence that shows that for students, Talent is not, not evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. This is due to structural racism and so on, which results in underrepresented students often being underprivileged and that, they, and that they have unequal access to education, resources, and experiences compared to their well-represented counterparts. This is why we want the diversity serving institution to serve as the lead to provide them more direct access to resources. And this will go also give them greater authority to shape and direct the educational partnership. This reasoning is in line with, with language from the diversity action agenda in which attention in the form of guidance and resources must go to where the students are concentrated as this may better lead them to and through graduate genomics training programs. So applicants will be expected to develop a two-year genomic research education program where students will be supported part-time during the academic year and full-time in the summer to conduct genomics research with participating faculty. The research experiences should take place at the research intensive institution. However, the research at the diversity serving institution is also encouraged if the research projects and the environment are well aligned with NHGRI's mission. So research experiences have been shown to increase student performance and, and retention in addition to providing valuable preparation for graduate school. However, of equal importance, the, the program must be complemented by other educational activities, such as course, courses, boot camps, seminars, lab meetings, career and professional development. And these activities should be conducted at both the applicant and the partnership institutions to maximize impact of the program. Also, students will be eligible for the program if they've already completed two academic years of post-secondary education. Applicants are expected to propose an outstanding mentoring plan, which should, which should uh, include a minimum of, uh, of students being assigned a mentor at each collaborating institute. And applicants must also propose effective monitoring and evaluation plans not only to assess the student outcomes, but to assess the effectiveness of the individual mentors as well. And the evaluation should also include an assessment of whether the overall program and its environments are considered to be effective, inclusive, safe, and supportive. 
So with regard to assessment of student outcomes, this is to be determined by the awardees. However, measurable outcomes should include, for example, the, the number of students matriculating through their research education program, and then those then admitted to graduate programs in STEM or a genomics related field. Other career outcomes, and do they stay engaged in research related profession? And then also documenting any presentations, publications, and awards. And awardees will, will be required to track student outcomes once students leave the program. And NHGRI will implement a long-term tracking procedure so as to conduct overall evaluation of the great program. So this program is modeled after other NIH R25 undergraduate diversity programs, including the Blueprint Endure program, a former BD2K program, which ended in 2020, and the NIEHS UP program. So the Endure and the BD2K program, they're similar to this great program in that both are institutional partnerships involving collaboration between a research intensive and diversity serving institution. The BD2K program had the further requirement like, like ours to have the diversity serving institution act as the lead. And for the NIEHS up program, institutional partnerships are not required, but they are encouraged. And the great program does have uh, set, does have closer alignment to the programmatic structure of this program compared to the others. And then the this R25 great program, it's similar to NHGRI's longstanding R25 DAP program, uh, diversity action plan, in that both our diversity research education programs focus at the undergraduate career level. The DAP program does support two other career levels and largely recruits individuals to their research intensive institutions for a summer or academic research experience, whereas the GREAT program would be a partnership program recruiting a cohort of individuals from within the applicant diversity serving institution. The programs in this sense complement and enhance the opportunities of underrepresented students based on career level, institution type, and educational activities offered. And then lastly, this great program uh, will encourage collaborations with universities that have an NHGRI funded T32 program. A couple of our DAP programs that do have a T32 at the same university do collaborate in this way with, with T32 graduate students getting involved in educational and peer mentoring activities. And this has proven to be beneficial. So for mechanism of support and funds anticipated, we are requesting RFA set aside funds. Applications would be limited to 350K direct costs per year. We would utilize the R25 mechanism, which is set at 8% indirects. We are considering to fund about three new awards a year for three years and with a, with a project period for up to five years. And then the total projected investment for nine awards would be 17 million. So I would like to now shift to council discussion. Some of the items we would particularly like your input on include the partnership idea and our definition of eligible institutions, uh, thoughts on the two-year requirement of the educational program, and then thoughts on the size and scope of the program. So we do feel that this is a modest investment. So uh, does it seem like an appropriate level to start with? And then any other points to consider? So, so three council members took a closer look at this concept. So doctors uh, Rafa Irizarry, Wendy Chung, and Lisa Parker. And so we asked that these three uh, uh, kick off the discussion. So maybe Rafa, do you want to start out? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I, uh, I think that the, the general proposal is I really don't have any uh, specific comments other than the ones that we discussed earlier, which you, I saw you incorporated um, in some of them. So, but I, I, the comment I wanna make relates to my main recommendation, which is it relates to trying to improve, trying to use data to improve how these programs work. So just quoting from, the, from one of the, uh, papers that the NHGRI has published, the field of genomics is affected by the same problematic lack of diversity that plagues and hampers the US research and clinical workforce. And for the past two decades, the federal government, universities and other nonprofit organizations have spent millions, probably billions of dollars trying to improve the situations. 
Well, since 2001, NHGRI has prioritized funding programs that increase the number of genomic strain researchers from this diverse group. But despite these efforts, the genomic research force has seen limited growth in the number of independent researchers from un underrepresented backgrounds. So I was encouraged to see that this proposal attempts to att attract students at an earlier career stage than previous efforts. So that's, that's a change because my first thought was, so how is this different from all these other efforts that have, that have we've invested in, but haven't really delivered in terms of overall trends and statistics. Um, but I'm optimistic that this particular idea of, of starting earlier has a potential of improving on previous attempts and the idea of, of jo joining institutions as you propose, which will give you a, a much larger pool to, to, um, to, attract, to attract from. So my main recommendation which is somewhat specific, is that the RDs be required to carefully define success metrics and that these metrics are not restricted to short-term goals, such as getting into grad school, that you, you've already hinted at that, that we have, we have, we may get improvements there, but then later they, they go away. And the data is collected to help determine what parts of these programs work and which don't. So I think we have to start using data to make these decisions uh, about what to fund. Of course, we haven't really collected much, so that'll happen later, but if we require these programs to do it, that might be helpful in the future. And, and data collection and, and these areas, I think I, I've, I've observed that often it reveals that well-intentioned ideas that sound promising actually have no effect or even have negative effects very surprisingly. So, that's why I'm, I'm highly recommending that we start doing more of this. It could also, and I should also say that, that analyzing data and looking at what works and what doesn't might inspire uh, new ideas uh, that haven't really been tried out up to, up to now. So I was, I was encouraged to hear that you, you've been using focus groups. So that's one way uh, to collect data. But I would, again, also encourage you to have our Ds also think of the long-term, helping NHER long-term by, by in a way running experiments, if you want to call it that, or natural experiments to see what works and what doesn't. Thank you for your comments, Robin. So Lisa Parker's hand is up. Why don't we go to her next? Thank you. Um, so this, I'm very enthusiastic about this opportunity. Um, I had four uh, specific uh, points I wanted to raise. Uh, one is that the uh, concept document that we read made reference to, and you did in your talk as well, of the um, applicant institutions taking the lead, um, having the flexibility to determine the optimal configuration, uh, but also having responsibility for the conduct and oversight of the award. Um, which on the one hand, I think is, is quite appropriate, but on the other hand, if these are somewhat less experienced uh, institutions lacking the infrastructure that their partner institution would have, uh, that may be off-putting. And so that perhaps some provision uh, for mentorship in this regard of the grantsmanship and grants administration or an, a plan for a mentoring relationship between the partnering and applicant institution uh, would be a welcome uh, amendment or opportunity. Um, secondly, I would hope that there was a provision, this, this follows up on the previous, uh, or complements the previous comment as well, that there's an opportunity and, um, maybe metrics developed, maybe not metrics, but that some record is kept of how capacity is developed at the applicant institutions. So that this is not, the, the success of this initiative is not measured solely in terms of the success of the individuals who are uh, educated through the program, but the capacity that's developed at the applicant institutions and what that would look like. Um, and what success it, it meets. And so ideally there could be some follow-on evaluation 
of the pipeline developed uh, even after the period of this particular program. And both of those uh, thoughts are uh, motivated by my concern that um, applicant institutions, the diversity serving institutions, not get an infusion of interest and funds and maybe equipment or activity in general, and then somewhat be left to their own devices, but that there is a real investment and, and a true development of partnership between the institutions partnering, but ideally also uh, with NHGRI. Um, a third quick point, I, I recognize that LC ed, uh, education and research uh, pipeline is, to, is an option uh, un, under this uh, concept and um, wonder whether when a, a reference is made to the um, progress, uh, ass review and assessment of progressive scientific skill sets as a metric, whether applicant institutions in particular would recognize that that applies to the development of the skill sets of doing social science research or even philosophical and humanities research and legal research in this area. Um, so that uh, being sure that the opportunity for LC research and maybe even a combination of LC and scientific genomic research be encouraged, in part because we might imagine, uh, and I think have some data to suggest, that attention to the LC issues is a way in for many of um, individuals from underserved groups um, or diversity serving institutions to be interested in and attracted to genomics. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, and then finally, um, throughout the, uh, the term used is undergraduates and undergraduates having two years of experience and so on. I, I wonder whether um, the experience for post-baccalaureate students is also available or continue on following undergraduate graduation, even if it has the, the program has begun for an individual during uh, college. Uh, because that, that seems also to be a crucial time, uh, particularly perhaps for those students who are served by these institutions, um, to bridge them forward into a graduate program and to enhance their applications and so forth with additional education. Um, and, and so having a provision so that people who are, are um, you know, graduating seniors or who come to this uh, a little late in their undergraduate career that they don't get left behind when they may in fact uh, be very promising uh, participants in the program. Thanks. Okay. All right. So to respond to some of your, your comments, uh, maybe going in reverse order. So with regard to post back, so um, we really wanted to just focus on the undergraduate career level for this concept. We do have the, uh, our existing DAP program which does support the post back level. So that would be kind of a more appropriate program to sponsor that career. Uh, and um, I appreciate your points about LC. We can make sure we have kind of stronger language when we get to writing the FOA to ensure that LC is definitely a part of this, this program. Um, and then with regard to, you know, helping the lead, you know, organization in terms of the application process and, and grant writing, um, so, uh, you know, you know we, can, we can start with the usual tools, right? You know, the availability of the program officer, posting FAQs, a pre-application we uh, webinar, which we often do for programs. We'll certainly do that for this one. We could think about in that webinar, just, you know, uh, emphasizing, uh, extending it and adding some more like grant, you know, the grant writing process. Or, you know, we can, in we can like think to develop a, a separate grant writing uh, process webinar. Um, we can also point them to, you know, there's other NIHY grant writing workshops and resources that are available. Um, and then with regard to, um, and also, uh, you know, we do have experience with helping investigators who are less familiar with the NIH system, not just pre-application, but post-award, you know, especially through our, our, through our uh, H3 Africa, Africa efforts. So I don't know, Jen, if you're on, if you maybe want to comment. Uh, through your experience with H3 Africa? 
Yeah, and I definitely want to say we appreciate the the sort of um, challenges that institutions that are less familiar with NIH processes and procedures will face and, and sort of being prepared to address those well in advance of when applications are due. Again, we do have that experience of, of sort of bringing institutions along and um, our, our grant management branch also has given webinars and seminars about the, the technicalities of applications and making sure you have your DUNS numbers and all that. So I think that's all good points. And also I really appreciate your point about the mentoring role that the, the more experienced institution would have because you're right, we do want this to be something where there's now a long-term ability for these institutions to be active members of our research community. Sharon? Uh, actually, how about if we oh. take comments yeah, from Wendy? Wendy and then come back to Sharon? Okay. So I'll just emphasize a couple other points that Rafa and Lisa said. Um, so number one is it drives me nuts as scientists that we don't use data more. And so I guess what drives me nuts is that across training programs, really it's not just this one, uh, but that we don't have systems in place and metrics that we standardize and agree upon to be able to see the return on our investment. And I just strongly encourage us to be data-driven as we're doing this. Um, the second, as Lisa said, what I've seen as some of the most productive things come out of this is not only the trainees, but as was said, the relationships between institutions that actually disseminate and build long-term uh, relationships and even relationships to the communities that are served. And so it spreads really successful programs I've seen uh, spread beyond just the trainees. Um, and then the one other point that I want to make is that um, it is hard sometimes for these institutions and one of the things that I've seen successful is that once the grants are awarded to be able to have some collaborative networking opportunities amongst the leadership in those programs, both post award to be able to understand how to manage those grants and also to share resources and in the zoom land space that we're in. Um, I've seen many of those training programs even have, for instance, online zoom um, that might be shared across institutions but then individual breakout sessions where they can have discussions and talk with their mentors. And it just is able to disseminate a lot more information and best practices and best resources that are developed by these programs uh, with a little less pain to the program. So anyway, I'm very, very supportive of this. I think it's a great, great mm -hmm. idea and great program. And um, I think we should do more of this. Well, one thing that we do do, as you know, Wendy, is that we do have an annual uh, a training and career development meeting where we bring all of our DAP and T32 trainees and PIs together for an annual meeting to network. And so we could have that as kind of a minimum in terms of uh, getting this program cohesive. And Tina, I think that's great. But just as an example, through our cancer centers, we even do that type of thing, but we have weekly meetings, believe yeah. it or not. So you mm -hmm. can even do more than that. Yes. Okay, I see Sharon and then Hal. Go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, just a couple of practical things as someone who's, who's a T32 PI, which is that it just says two years. Um, normally, especially for undergraduates, you know, they may decide this isn't for them. Um, and I think you need, and you also could have a junior who really has sort of blossomed that you would love to give a year to. So I, I would try to build a little bit more flexibility um, so you don't have people like not thinking they have that they're able to really appoint the best person. Um, also, I think it helps undergraduates to say, you know, at the end of the first year, you have to write up a report and give a plan for your second year of funding and that it's not automatic, but you know, that you need a plan. So I think something like that. The other thing is I would think creatively about what are the obstacles for students applying. Applying to graduate school costs money. Um, luckily, the GREs are sort of disappearing, but not for all fields. So also thinking about whether any of the funding could actually go into actually supporting application process of the, of the trainees to graduate school or other appropriate schools, mm -hmm. some kind of grant to the student themselves, I think could also be a big push, uh, not push, but remove an obstacle that they might have. Thank you for that. Okay, we've got Hal, then Jonathan, then Howard. Go ahead, Hal. 
Um, so just to expand briefly on a few points that have been made, um, one program that I've seen do this particularly well is the Sarnoff Foundation, um, which creates a mentoring network for life. You know, once you've uh, been uh, awarded a fellowship, um, you are, you know, uh, in into inside a network um, that allows you to tap into expertise at every point along your career. Um, the other thing that the Sarnoff Foundation does that I think works particularly well is to require um, people who have uh, been awarded uh, fellowships to then commit to a mentoring relationship with uh, you know, years of young people who are coming up um, in the uh, Sarnoff uh, funding network. So um, you know, that requirement of having the people who have been through the program and benefited from it to then share their experience uh, through mentorship um, really uh, has proven very powerful. And uh, I think it's something that should be considered for this program. Yeah, we would, we would be encouraging like near peer mentoring. Jonathan. Okay, a, a, a comment, what I hope is a very simple question. So my, my comment is that in, in your presentation, you, you indicated that uh, the partnering institution, if they had a T32 and NHG or IT32, that that would be an, an encouraged thing. I think I, I totally get the advantage or the, the, the simplicity of potentially having the, the students matriculate into that, into that institution or whatever, but it seems to me that, that uh, it might be a little bit limiting to other institutions that haven't had the opportunity to have an NHG or IT32 uh, they might not be considered quite at the same level in terms of looking for partnerships or being part of being a partnership. So I'm not sure that I would, you know, state that explicitly. It's it's clearly going to be an advantage. The reviewers are going to see that as an advantage anyway. So I'm not sure that you you want to limit that. Um, my question is, um, how many students do you think are, would get appointed on each one of these grants? How many students would get supported on these grants? Well, we kind of set it at 350K direct costs. And then just based on looking at other R25 educational programs that are out there, um, we were estimating it would support around 10 undergraduates. But it, it, okay. you know, it's going to vary quite a bit in terms of you know, the programmatic structure that is set up. Yeah. Uh, Howard, go ahead. Tina, this is a very promising concept, and so thank you for, for sharing this. Um, so this particular program is aimed at a diversity-serving institution and partnering them with a higher education research institution. So my comments about the opportunity to expand that to also for-profit institutions, because as we all know, a lot of genomics uh, research and science is being practiced at, at many companies, and these uh, often at these institutions are actually running uh, internship programs, just clearly an interest in that way. And that might maybe actually potentially allow you to increase the bandwidth of, of the program, either in this version or in a future version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well, at least for the applicant institution, we definitely want that to be a higher education institution. But for partnerships, we, we would be open to having companies for profits and nonprofits uh, uh, serving as a partner. Other questions? Len, go ahead. Is the 8% indirect a barrier for eligibility for anyone or is that easily absorbed? Um, so I'm not quite understanding your question. So the R25 mechanism is set at 8% indirect. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm just saying if an institute needs complete cost recovery or doesn't have the ability to cover whatever else overhead is needed, does that prevent certain people from applying? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. And then uh, in terms of, you know, we'll, we'll also kind of set like how much administrative cost they can, they can um, uh, incorporate into their applications and considering it's a partnership, we would definitely be kind of allowing a, you know, like a higher administrative cost than we normally do. Isn't that an NIH rule, the 8%? I thought yes, that's but I'm just curious, yeah. like okay. if you want eligibility and people can't apply, that's a barrier. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about in the direct costs in terms of what what the maximum allowed administrative costs would be allowed on the grant versus like, you know, costs going to the to the trainees themselves. 
So I think, Len, this is Carolyn, just following up on your point. I mean, it is a it is a limitation of the mechanism and it carries across NIH for lots of different training mechanisms. One of the things we've talked about internally is we see this as a um, three, you know, we have three receipt dates. So we're not, and so one of the things we may see in the first round is are there barriers or issues that come up in doing this? Mm -hmm. And then can we have creative ways to address those barriers? So I don't think we can do a lot of flexibility around this, but if we start to find that coming up as something that's a barrier to the program, that is something we would then have to see if there's some creative options we could look at. Does that? Yeah, no, that sounds good. I mean, it, the, the R25s have existed, so you shouldn't reinvent yeah. the wheel either. Like if you network and just ask the question, who's not being allowed to apply, that yes. would be good to know. Thank you. That's a good point, thank you. Can I ask council how important co-localization in terms of geographic localization, how important that is between the two partnering institutions? If, um, if the student is expected to maintain research progress during the school year, it's, uh, and the research is going on at the uh, research intensive institution, it, it seems like it's kind of uh, obligatory that they be very closely um, physically associated. Thank you, Hal. Olga, Olga, did you want to comment? Or did yeah. you have another question? No, I, I want to comment on that same uh, point. I would say that it depends. I think, you know, we've had a pretty active program at Princeton just, you know, uh, with uh, some of the uh, colleges down south in Florida and it's worked great. And we had, you know, they're in the summer here, but you can imagine, for example, especially if it's a computational experimental project, they might do experiments at the research intensive institution in the summer, then they go back and they either continue some very specific protocols or they can do the computation and analysis back in their uh, institution. I would be as broad as possible with this uh, and really work on the support on all the issues that have been raised, not issues, but challenges that have been raised rather than make location-based restrictions. Yeah, so with regard to geographical, geographical constraint and I mean, during the academic year, because there's also a time constraint on the students as well, so it could be in the summer times, like Olga was saying, that there's the more the focus on the research experiences in any boot camps. And then again, you know, the, the important element of this program is also those other educational activities, right? And so that could be more of the focus like during the academic year, right? You know, where they could participate and, um, you know, just other activities like attending seminars, attending the mentors lab meetings and, uh, to taking any courses and, and any professional and career development activities. Lisa, did you have a comment? I did. Um, given that some of these students will be inexperienced, historically inexperienced, maybe within their, their own families and social circle with travel, with going to another institution, with different geographic areas, this may be a, a possibility. I think having a broad possibility for ge geographic partnership would actually be advantageous for some of them. Also, if this truly is to be um, open to, to LC researchers there, as well as for some of the other uh, you know, computational research and so on, uh, as well as whatever happens during COVID, if uh, we have shown that we can do a lot with long distance, um, I would say try to keep it as open as possible geographically for a variety of, for that variety of reasons. Okay. Olga, another comment? Sorry, just a quick question. I may have missed it, Tina, but uh, is there some plan, like if a minority institution is trying to apply for this and they don't have a partner institution in mind, would NHGRI be able to, I mean, maybe not match make, but at least make some suggestions of contacts they could pursue? Yeah, that's true. They can they can contact the program officer, who would probably be me, and I can make suggestions and you know point to our website where we have listed out all of our T thirty two programs. For one example, how if that's the case, um, is it necessary that a diversity um, serving institution partner with only one research intensive institution, or could it? Oh no, o open definitely to more than one. Uh, you know, there's 
you know, the indoor program, there's plenty of examples where there's multiple partners that are involved in those programs, so, so definitely. Okay, last call for questions. I don't see any more hands up. All right, can I get a motion to approve the concept? So moved. In a second. 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 Okay. All in favor, I'm gonna ask you to hold your hands up for five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Any opposed or abstaining? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Thank you.